Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Do outcomes differ for VET and higher education qualified workers in the same occupation? My name is Melinda Lees, and I will be chairing today's discussion. Today, we are using GoToWebinar by LogMeIn. For those of you who aren't familiar with this platform, I will briefly explain some of the components. To the left of the screen is the GoToWebinar viewer, through which you will see the presentation. To the right is the GoToWebinar control panel, where you can select audio mode and ask questions. To join the audio portion of today's webinar using VOIP, choose computer audio. Otherwise, select phone call. Using the questions panel to the right of your screen, you can submit written questions and comments online at any time. For privacy reasons, only we can see your question. We will acknowledge all questions and comments submitted by the questions panel, either during the webinar today or afterwards via email. The report on which this webinar is based can be found in the handout section and can be downloaded at your convenience. Today's webinar, Do Outcomes Differ for VET and Higher Education Qualified Workers in the Same Occupation, is based on the report that was released on the 7th of September. Presenting today, we have Bridget Wybrow from NCVER and Dr. Kane Polidano from the University of Melbourne. Also joining us is Michelle Blitzevs from the Association of Consulting Surveyors. Before I hand over to our presenters, I would like to provide some background on the research that will be presented today. In many occupations, we are seeing a growing trend towards needing an entry level qualification where a qualification was previously not required. And in some occupations, we are seeing the need for a higher level qualification, for example, a bachelor's degree instead of a certificate. There has also been a wealth of research looking into the outcomes of VET and higher education graduates overall. Some of this research points to VET having more positive outcomes for certain student categories, such as males with lower ATAR scores, and to higher education for females with lower ATAR scores. The research we're talking about today is different from previous research, as it looks at the outcomes for VET and higher education qualified people working in the same occupation. We examine whether, examine whether these employees do the same tasks and have the same job outcomes, such as salary and career pathways. The first stage of the research explored data from the Household Income and Labour Dynamics in Australia survey, also known as HILDA, to ascertain labour market outcomes for VET and higher education qualified employees in the same occupation while the second stage consisted of qualitative interviews with employers to build on the quantitative findings for specific occupations. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Kane Polidano to talk through the results from the stage one HILDA analysis. Thank you, Kane. Thanks, Mel. Um, before starting, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the lands of the Wurundjeri people who's, who I was born on and um, who I also work and, and, um, and live on. Um, before I move on, I'm just trying to find my slides, which, which seem to have disappeared. We might have to do a forum. Kane, I'm happy to, to take control of this and do it for you if you like. Yeah, just, that might uh, be best, Mum. Just yeah. let me know next slide and I'll flick it on to next slide. No worries. Yeah, that might be best. Okay. Brilliant. Technology is great when it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah as well as acknowledging um, 
uh, the custodians of whose land I, I work and live on. I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors, um, Julie Moscon and also um, Daniel Fisher. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the contributions from NCVR in the feedback um, for this work, especially Tabitha, Joy and also Mel. Um, the aims of the research, as, as Melinda sort of outlined, is to try and look, try and compare the outcomes, labour market outcomes of those who do have a vet qualification versus those who are higher education trained in occupations where both credentials um, are recognised in employment. Um, and as Melinda said, we use data from, from HILDA um, and we, we identify three groups. So when we talk about vet trained, what we mean is um, a group which is vet only trained, a group that's vet and higher education trained, and a third group which is um, higher education only trained. And so what we do is we compare those who are vet only and vet and higher education trained versus those that are higher education trained only using HILDA. And the beauty of HILDA, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is that it's a very rich data set um, that has many, many outcomes. And in this case, we, we can examine over, well, compare um, outcomes in over 50 different um, employment uh, conditions and also different um, aspects of the nature of the work, such as complexity, um, stress, autonomy and repetition. And finally, we can compare reported job satisfaction between those groups um, across multiple domains, including satisfaction with the work, um, pay and overall job satisfaction. Thanks, Mel. So how do we define the education groups? So the way we do this is look at those that are what we call prime age in HILDA, they're 25 to 56. And um, we, we, we allocate them to the three different groups, depending on their, um, all of the qualifications attained. And so we distinguish VET from higher education qualifications um, according to the AQF framework with VET being any qualification lower than a bachelor degree. So that includes qualifications such as an associate degree, advanced diploma, diploma, um, certificate one to four, and also unknown certificates. Whereas higher education qualifications are bachelor degrees, master's degrees, graduate diplomas, graduate certificates, um, and bachelor degrees. And yeah, as I said before, assignment to those three groups depends on which combination of qualifications people have attained, so either vet only, higher education only, or combinations. Those without any qualifications who are working in these select occupations are omitted from the analysis. Thanks, Mel. Occupations, so how do we define these occupations that have both vet credentials and also higher education credentials working in the same uh, job? So what we do is we take the three digit ANSCO occupations from um, at least uh, from, from HILDA and we look at whether or not those occupations have at least 10 respondents from each of the categories. So that means we have to have to be included in the analysis, there has to be at least 10 respondents who have a VET only qualification working the occupation, at least 10 with VET and higher education working in the same occupation and also at least 10 with just a higher education qualification. And when we apply that filter to the data, we identify around 24 white collar jobs, including jobs such as early education teachers, midwifery and nursing professionals, social and welfare professionals, health and welfare support workers, sales assistants, sales managers, construction managers, project administrators, and engineer professionals. Uh, the sample in total is around is 2,723 Hilda respondents aged 25 to 56. This is a big chunk of the population in wave 11. So this is about 29% of all um, respondents in Hilda aged 25 to 56. Thanks, Mel. Um, now the analytical approach is really motivated by the fact that if you were to just compare vet credential um, yeah, uh, people versus or education credential people working in the same occupation, you're going to get, you're going to have, you're going to have issues um, in doing just simple comparisons. Mainly, the, if you just did the simple comparisons, what you're going to find is that some of the differences in outcomes are going to be driven not just because of differences in the credentials, but also because of differences in the nature of people who have both who have higher education 
and vet um, credentials. And for instance, we know that um, those with vet credentials are more likely to be from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And it could be that um, the differences in outcomes might just reflect differences in, in the places where people with vet qualifications live versus higher, those with higher education qualifications. So we need to make adjustments for differences in the characteristics of people who are in these two, who have these two different types of credentials. Um, the other adjustment that it's important to make is to make sure that we are comparing people within very much the same occupation. So if we didn't um, control for differences in occupations, um, what you would find is that by and large, for instance, people in vet, with vet qualifications are more likely to be seen in say construction, whereas those um, with higher education qualifications more likely to be in say in teaching profession. And those different occupations have different different outcomes. So it's important to control for um, differences in, in the occupations that they work in as well. And to do this, we estimate this regression model, which is not as complicated as it looks. We've got 50, more than 50 uh, outcomes. Each outcome has a different regression model. And we regress the outcome versus binary measures of vet, uh, vet um, credentials, and also controls for individual characteristics such as personality traits, the region, age, gender, and background um, of people in the analysis. And then we also control for occupations, and that's at the three digit ANSCO level again. Thanks, Mel. So what are some of the key results? So the key results, uh, they reflect the, the beta one and beta two that were explained in the previous um, model. And they reflect um, differences between vet trained and higher education trained um, who work in the same occupations. And the conclusions are that we see real, really no difference in many of the core employment conditions between vet trained, and that's both um, vet only and vet and higher education, and higher education only. So amongst those three groups, for a lot of outcomes, we don't see any difference. And those, those outcomes include employment rates, pretty much the same, rates of casual employment are the same, hours work the same, rates of on the job training, annual and sick leave entitlements, use of paid leave and rates of concern over job loss, no difference. However, we, when, we do, when we do look at the vet only outcomes compared to the higher education only outcomes, we still do, we do see some differences. And those differences include those with vet only qualifications have lower wages. They're more likely to have non-standard work schedules. They have less access, reported access to paid paternity leave and apparent fewer promotion opportunities. So they have fewer supervisory responsibilities um, and, no, and lower rates of completion. Thanks, Mel. Also, it's true to say that vet only trained, compared to higher education only, um, report they have jobs that are less dynamic. So that means typically those with vet only qualifications, they report having less autonomy in their work. Um, they have less over autonomy over when they take a break, what, what type of work they do, how they do the work, when they do the work. The jobs that they report are more repetitive, so they're less, there's a less variety of tasks and more repetition. And they report um, lower, uh, less, that their jobs are less challenging, so they have fewer opportunities to use initiative, undertake complex and difficult work, and um, less likely to report having to learn new skills in their job. There's no, despite those differences, there's no strong evidence that the vet only trained are less satisfied with their work um, compared to um, higher education only. So they're at least as satisfied um, with the ability to jug, juggle work and life commitments, job security and hours of work. Um, but they have slightly lower satisfaction with pay, but this result is just on the margin of significance. It's not highly significant. And as I said before, we don't really see any major differences um, between higher education and vet trained and higher education only trained. Next slide, thanks, Minda. And now I'm going to throw to Bridget to continue the conversation um, on um, some of the qualitative analysis that she did. Right, thank you, Kane. So I want to build on the Hilda analysis that Kane's just spoken about. Um, we um, held 20 interviews with employers across four occupations, which you can see on the screen there. 
Um, it's important to note that these are at the six digit ANSCO level, which is the most specific that you can get. Um, and I just also wanted to point out that I'm using the term childcare workers um, because that's what ANSCO has them as, but they're known as educators now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about findings, um, you know, about the four occupations together and later on um, we'll go into surveying in more detail when I chat to Michelle. Um, but before I go into the findings, I just want to take a moment to thank all the employers that, um, that participated in interviews because without them I wouldn't have been able to do this research. So to begin with, I just want to touch on some of the employers' views on the qualifications. Um, the employers spoke about how the preferences for qualifications have changed over time. So for example, in surveying there is no minimum um, level qualifi uh, qualification level, sorry, um, but there is a push for um, a certificate for, for certain types of jobs. So it might be government contracts or high risk areas like in tunnels. Um, in childcare, there never used to be a minimum qualification. Um, then at one point it moved to a certificate two, and now it is a certificate three level. And there's other um, regulations that also influence qualification level in childcare, so that at least 50% of the um, educators must be diploma qualified. Um, with medical laboratory technicians, um, it's really a VET qualification that is required. But what they're seeing is that there's now an oversupply of people with um, medical science degrees or science degrees. And so these people are applying for those jobs. And with graphic design, there, there is no minimum qualification at all. It's based more around your, the individual talent. Um, employers also spoke about how practical um, vocational qualifications are and that they provide great experience for um, workers in using tools and um, equipment which is relevant to the job whereas the higher education qualifications provide more of a theoretical background and help people to develop a broader set of skills and knowledge such as people management, um, presentation skills and project management and employers felt that this was due to the longer nature of the degrees you know quite often four years as compared to 18 months or two years. And then we also spoke to employers, you know, whether they thought there's any differences between the types of people that did VET qualifications and those that did higher education qualifications. And they didn't really think so. The only biggest difference that they may suggest is in aspirations. So they believe that those that did higher education qualifications, um, you know, were more likely to see the occupation as a career, whereas those who did VET were more likely to see it as just a job. But obviously this is the views of a small um, number of employers and not the workers themselves. So it's not um, able to be generalised at all. I also spoke to employers about um, their recruitment processes. And what we found is that employers openly recruit for both qualification levels and were likely to specify a VET qualification as a minimum. Um, the only occupation that wasn't likely to specify any qualification in the advertising um, was graphic design, um, as you know, the portfolio was seen as more important. Uh, another influence on qualification level during recruitment is the potential pathway of a position. So one example is in surveying. So if they expected that a position may need to evolve into a licensed surveyor in the future, they would then look for someone with a higher education degree. And this is because to become a licensed surveyor, you must have a higher education degree and then um, complete a training agreement. Um, pathology provi providers um, preferred to hire people with VET qualifications as they had been trained for that particular position and tended to stay in the role longer. But what all employees made clear um, is that the qualification level is not the most important um, thing they look for during recruitment. So things like experience, skills, the performance at interview um, and team fit were often as important if not more so than the qualification. Another area um, I spoke to employers about was the jobs and tasks that both vet and higher education qualified workers um, do. So what we found is that 
Um, the ratio of VET to high education qualified um, people employed per occupation varied from 20% with VET qualifications to 80% with VET qualifications. So childcare had the most VET qualified workers and graphic design having the least. Across the four occupations, um, the jobs and tasks of VET in higher education qualified workers um, were similar um, as they were dependent on the position and not on the qualification, but there may be some differences um, for individuals and it tended to relate it to their own strengths. Um, an ex exception though was for childcare workers where there was more responsibility for people with higher education qualifications and this was particularly around um, leading and supporting pedagogical practice in their room. Um, other tasks um, were common between the two such as the, that related to the care, education, safety and supervision of children. Um, we also asked employers if they noticed any similarities and differences um, between the VET and higher education qualified workers already employed in their organisations. So most employers noted that um, those with VET qualifications tend to be more job ready and hit the ground running and this is due to their experience with um, using the tools. Um, these people however tended to have less theoretical knowledge or broad based skills. Um, on the other hand, those with the higher education qualifications had more theoretical knowledge and the other skills such as presentation, but they needed more help uh, with using tools. But this um, only tended to exist in the short term, whereas the gap in theoretical knowledge remained in the long term for VET qualified workers. We also discussed with employers similarities and differences in regarding outcomes such as salary, um, additional training, expectations and job pathways. So for most occupations, the starting salary um, was reflective of the position and not the qualification and then obviously future remuneration was determined by performance. However, for occupations where there are awards such as childcare, the qualification level did impact on salary. Uh, any additional training um, that people needed was based more on individual needs and experience rather than on qualification level. So there was no blanket rule that someone with a VET qualification would need additional training in this and vice versa. Um, employers also stated that they placed similar expectations on VET and higher education qualified workers and that's because it was based on the position and not the qualification. You know, that's why they were hired. Um, there were some differences for each occupation regarding the job pathways though. So for graphic designers, the pathways for VET and higher education qualified workers are the same and dependent on their individual performance and skills. For surveyors, the pathways are generally the same unless they want to become a licensed surveyor where a higher education degree is necessary. Although it was noted um, that a person with a VET qualification would need exceptional skills and experience to move into management. In childcare, there were differences between centres. So for some, they noted that VET qualified workers could um, you know, become directors of centres, whereas for others, they preferred a higher um, education qualified person for this. Um, for medical laboratory technicians, um, the VET qualified people have fixed duties, um, as this is the role they were trained for whereas the, those with higher education degrees, they could move on to scientist roles. The interviews were also an opportunity for employers to speak about the VET qualifications and suggest some changes they would like to see. So I just wanna note that these are the views of only a few employers per occupation, so may not be generalizable to all. So in childcare, um, these employers would like to see more practical experiences. So they've noticed that there's a gap between VET and the actual requirements of the job, which they would like to see address. So for example, they found that some people coming out of um, a certificate or diploma may not have experience changing nappies or um, communicating and working with others, such as within a team and also with families. And these employers provide mentoring in the workplace to overcome 
or they actually prefer to hire people as trainees so they can train them in this as they go. For surveying, um, most of the employers found that the general content of the VET qualifications is good, um, but they would like to see more flexible delivery options. So for them, it's really important that um, someone can, you know, study while they are working with them. Uh, with graphic design, um, what they really wanted to see was the development of conceptual thinking and presentation skills, because this is actually a large part of the role that a graphic designer does. You know, they need to present, um, you know, brand ideas, etc., to clients and actually, you know, tell them the story of how they came up with the solution. Um, they also suggested including more business skills um, in the qualifications, as many people who complete the VET qualification may move into freelancing, um, particularly after COVID. So this could include things like um, charge out rates, how to get an ABN, how to invoice, all those sorts of skills. With the medical laboratory technicians, um, they really wanted to see those certificates three and four level qualifications front loaded with pre-analytical and point of care skills, as this is where they found a lot of mistakes would happen. Um, another employer mentioned that the diploma should be two years in, in length and contain more advanced content. So at the moment um, in their state, it's 18 months. Um, employers would also like to see a work placement because they want the people to actually have experience working in the laboratory before they apply for jobs. During the interviews, there were some other issues that arose that were relevant to more than one occupation. Um, if you're interested in any of the occupation specific issues, they're, they're in the appendices of the report. Um, so first, employers, sorry, my little graphics disappeared there. Um, first, employers believed that there needed to be a better recognition of prior learning and credit pathways. So employers and surveying, they gave examples of how um, universities do not provide, or some universities do not, do not provide any credit for VET qualifications where others do. And so they believe that the recognition of VET qualifications and skills should be consistent across all universities. Um, employers, particularly those of surveyors and medical laboratory technicians, um, believe that there should be scope for um, people with VET qualifications to um, progress the same as those with higher education qualifications. So in surveying, this means that some, you know, a surveyor um, who has the right skills and ability should be able to progress to become a licensed surveyor, even if they don't have a higher education qualification. Um, so they could potentially undertake an exam which would test their knowledge and skills before being accepted into the training agreement that all licensed surveyors um, must do. Um, and then another issue that was raised was the need for more accurate career guidance. So, you know, the employers really spoke about how people need to understand the options that are available to them and the potential pathways um, following, the, following the completion of a qualification. And this was um, regularly raised by employers of the childcare workers and medical laboratory technicians. So tying together the, the analysis presented by Kane and the interviews with the employers, the key overall findings are, you know, the employers do act, you know, do actively recruit for both um, vet and higher education qualified people, and they place value on both qualifications. You know, they, you know, they see value in having both um, in their organisations. Um, vet and higher education qualified individuals, they do the same jobs and tasks and have the same salary when they first enter employment. Um, the exception is for childcare workers where qualification level influences um, the award, weight, award rate. Um, vet graduates, they tend to be more job ready when they enter the workforce as they have experience using tools and equipment because of the technical nature of the qualification. On the other hand, higher education graduates may need a little help in that department initially, but they have broader knowledge and additional skills compared to their VET counterparts. So, however, while they may be doing the same jobs and skills initially, over time, those of higher education qualifications tend to have more career progression opportunities and higher wages. And this is, you know, partly because of that broader knowledge and skills obtained through their 
qualifications. Uh, and based on the interviews with employers, there stood out, you know, a few things, um, you know, that could be seen as advice for people choosing vet qualifications. So employers noted that it was really important to have the understand have an understanding of the interested uh, the industry that the person is interested in working in, and that this could be of benefit when applying for jobs. So for graphic design, this involves you know knowing about the tasks that designers do that are beyond you know the technical. And for pathology providers, this is understanding what it is like to work in a laboratory. Another thing um, you know people need to consider is what the aspirations are and understand that they may need to engage in lifelong learning to continue to progress in the, their career. You know, there were many um, opportunities within the four occupations explored in the research for workers to progress, but not in the traditional upwards fashion. So for example, um, childcare workers, they can move into working with um, special needs children, surveyors could branch into other fields of um, surveying, and medical laboratory technicians can be different, be given different types of tests to do. So while the data and the findings may show that the career trajectories for, are less for vet qualified individuals, it's more that the opportunities are different. And finally, if a vet qualified person is interested in the traditional upwards career progression pathway, then they may need to undertake a degree to achieve, to achieve this. Also based on the research, there are a few um, areas where improvements could be made. So pathways between vet and higher education qualifications, you know, they're important as they help people to build upon previous study, and they could transition to higher skilled occupations and support lifelong learning. But there needs to be consistency in how credit is applied for previous qualifications and experience. And there also needs to be flexibility in the study options so that people can study and work at the same time. As touched on before, um, career guidance and advice can be improved. So two areas in particular raised in this research um, is the need to better understand the qualification required and then the pathways available for an occupation. Additionally, the accuracy of information on career websites can be better. For example, some websites state that you must have a university degree to become a surveyor, but this is not the case. Um, you know, speaking with industry peak bodies could be a way to update this. And then related to this one is the need for ANSCO to be updated. So some of the terminology that is used is out of date. So we've already mentioned um, ANSCO uses the term childcare workers, whereas they're actually known as educators now. And then additionally, some of the information relating to occupations is out of date as well. Um, so ANSCO suggests that a certificate two qualification is needed to become a childcare worker, but the minimum is now a certificate three. And so, and a lot of the career websites actually base their information on what is, in, is contained in ANSCO. So updating this will help to improve um, the websites too. So now to um, expand on the findings, um, I wanted to speak to Michelle and ask her a few questions to help us gain a deeper understanding of the topic, um, particularly for surveyors. Thanks um, for having me. It's great to be part of this research. Well, we're very glad you could join us. So just, um, Michelle, my first question is, you know, why do you think it is important to have different educational pathways available for becoming a surveyor? Well, I think that, uh, and for my, most professions, I mean, as you've outlined, a, a number of them are different. And I think that uh, we're fairly unique because we do have the degree and the vocational pathway, but there's different tasks that are involved and therefore there's different skill sets. And, you know, there are some people that just, a four year or most of ours are five these days, a five year degree could scare off people. Whereas what a vocational education does is it allows you to kind of try before you buy. So you can enter the workplace and start training and start learning and start doing and earning a salary and see if you like it. And then you can see which direction you might want to take that career. And hopefully for us, you'll go on and do a degree, but not everybody does. And that's absolutely fine. We need assistance in our 
field. We need um, people who are skilled on the tools and we need them to be qualified. So we don't actually have any legal requirements to undertake the vocational education pathway. We encourage people to do it. But as you mentioned, I've got uh, four or five states around this country that don't offer it at all. So that's a solution that we as an industry have had to find because they are not delivering for us. And we don't have any private providers. So it's a challenge, the whole vet area. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Michelle. Um, one other thing that we noticed in our research is that um, employers were of the view that the vet in higher education qualified workers essentially do the same job. So they can be out in field taking measurements or in the office doing calculations. So you touched on this briefly already. So does this match what you have come across or are there differences, you know, maybe based on company size? It's not usually based on company size. What we find is that a registered or licensed surveyor needs about six people working with him to deliver the actual plan. So the plan that we all have for our homes, you know, that kind of determines the plot of land that we own, that is signed off by a registered surveyor can take three or four people to make sure that that's accurate. And so uh, you, you've sort of got a picture of one of the devices there. These are heavy. Uh, you put, you've all seen them out on the road, haven't you? They usually have yellow legs. And there's one guy at one end and there's another guy at the other end. And sometimes they use robotics these days. There's quite a lot of data that needs to be collected. And so the surveyors who are out in the field, who are often the vocationally trained surveyors, um, you know, they are collecting the data that then comes back that somebody has to analyse, then somebody needs to process it, then they put it into a plan, then it has to be lodged with the titles office. Uh, sometimes it needs to be lodged with the council, it has to be approved. So there's a whole lot of roles that go on. It's too much for one surveyor. Uh, and so they really do need that support. And so for us, the level of expertise that is needed to actually sign the plan that determines, determines the size of your block of land, uh, they have to be registered or licensed by the government. And uh, because the government likes to charge you tax on that block of land that you own. And so they want to make sure that it's accurate. And so it's a very important role. And so the government regulates that component of the work. And because the government regulates it, there's quite a lot of stringent uh, examination that is required before they will give you that licence. So whereas vocational education is, for me and for in surveying, usually a kind of an entry level component where we, we sort of have the basics and you, you get the basics and you get the basic skills that can then take you on. But if you want to sign that plan that becomes a legal entity in the titles office, because only a registered or licensed surveyor can sign your plan, the government says they're the only ones that can do it, that requires a whole lot more responsibility, which requires a whole lot more study. It's a bit like a surgeon, you know, you don't just want the night, you know, you, you probably don't want Melanie operating on you unless she's got a degree and she's done the research and she's done the study and, you know, all of that sort of thing. So it's a little bit the same for us when it comes to our house, which is usually the biggest investment that we make in our lives. So I think to, to go back to answer the question, uh, I think that uh, there are levels of qualification and the reason is because of the responsibility that comes with that. Um, and so we actually are finding, I was interested, you know, to hear earlier that you can't progress if you've only got a vocational qualification. We would say that that's not necessarily the case. We are seeing more and more now, um, and probably not the ones you interviewed, but we are seeing more and more that there are vocational educationally trained people with diplomas that are running their own businesses and employing registered surveyors, which we're a bit excited to see. It's a fairly new phenomenon almost since COVID, so it's great. And would you say, like, you know, you spoke about some of the different roles that, you know, you got the people that do the field work and those that are doing the calculations. Would, um, could that be like, you know, could a vet person also be doing the qualifications in the office as well? Like, it just depends on, you know, how long they've been in the field for? Yeah, I mean, there is, there, is a, there is a level of skill and expertise that is required to actually analyse that data. So the gathering of the data is the part that is often the technically trained um, pathway for surveyors. Uh, but the actual calculation and surveying is, is very precise. 
And so you need a level of, of experience and education. Now, I know that some that you spoke to said, well, if you've been doing it for 20 years, then you should be able to, you know, be able to get registered. Um, we've just recently done a national competency standard uh, since you did your research uh, that's been done by our council of reciprocating boards of surveyors around the country and they have determined what is a, a national standard for surveying and um, unfortunately the level of skill and uh, what is taught at a vocational level is not going to meet the requirements for that standard. So there is a requirement for higher education to come in because they just go that little bit deeper and that little bit further. What we need as an industry is for there to be an easy path from a diploma into a degree, and we need them to get recognition for the study that they've done in the diploma. So currently, because the, the VET system says competent, not competent, we actually need a score. We need an 80%, we need an 85%. We need to know particularly how their mathematics is and those things. And so competent, not competent doesn't work for a number of our universities. Um, and so what we need is a grading process through vocational education that gets them into the door of the university so that they can go on and do some of this more precise activity that's required within the regulations. So just touching on that, Michelle, um, do you find um, or do you know, like, are there many people that actually take that pathway going from the VET qualification to the degree? So I know the um, employees I spoke to, you know, they didn't know of many people within the organisations that had done that. Yeah, um, it seems to be that students either go straight to university and then they go on the registration pathway. Uh, very few of them will go through a VET pathway, although we do hear those that do go through a VET pathway are better surveyors because they've learned on the job before they've done their degree. So they have a very practical knowledge before they go on and do the degree. There are some of them, but the challenge that we have, as I mentioned, I've got four states, including Queensland, which has the second highest number of surveyors in the country that offers no vocational education qualification. So uh, that's a real problem for our industry. In fact, we have just launched our own certificate and diploma courses through the Surveyors Academy, partnering with an RTO to deliver that because I haven't been able to get TAFE to deliver it. So we are now delivering ourselves in Queensland and Tasmania and the ACT where we just don't have these courses. Uh, and so it's a Northern Territory is the other one. And so, you know, it's quite a problem, especially for the smaller states. And so some of that challenge that you found when you interviewed is that no, they don't go on because actually they don't even have a diploma because there's no requirement to have that qualification and no need to go on. So it, it is a problem for us and uh, we need more registered surveyors. We, we do a demand study um, every five years when the census comes out and we're, we're short about a thousand around the country. So wow. the government wants to build bridges, roads, highways, new housing communities and we just do not have enough surveyors to build everything that they need. With your um, Surveyor Academy, um, because the other thing, the obviously the not having courses available is one thing um, raised by employers, but also the you know flexible delivery options. Is that what you're um, doing there? You know, offering it you know online or how is that delivered? Yeah, that that was a real problem for us. So um, we, particularly in the mining area, so surveyors work in mines and they make sure that the mine tunnel is going in the right place. They also measure. Uh, all that stuff that comes out of the ground. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a, they need to be qualified. They need to be trained. Um, and TAFE, who have been our only deliverer, I know childcare and many of the others that you've mentioned have private offerings. We have not in surveying because it's quite a small profession. And so TAFE requires students to come five days a week to study or four days a week to study. And that's a problem because they need to work, they need to fly in, fly out, you know, these sorts of challenges. And so the, the model that we have developed has been based on what our businesses are asking for. And that is a, yes, you need to study, you need classroom theoretical training, like it's just a fact of education. Everybody needs it. Look at the people on this webinar today. You know, we all need to continually develop professionally. And so they need that face-to-face, -face, which we 
do online because we've got students from all over Australia. But the rest of what they do and learn can be done on the job. I mean, traineeships and apprenticeships have always been with somebody on the job. And so we've got them working practically in the field every other day, and then we are checking in on them, assessing them. And so what we're doing is we're taking our trainers and assessors to them rather than making them come to us. Uh, and so, you know, in Melbourne, they always had to go to Melbourne. Well, that's great, except if you live at Shepparton or, you know, Bendigo or some sort of mile away place, even Ballarat, you know, it's hard to get to Melbourne. Uh, and so what we're doing is providing a more flexible offering that is allowing them to learn on the job. We're also having surveyors teach surveyors. Another challenge that we sometimes find in vocational education is that people who are doing the teaching may not be the best and most qualified people. Um, it's great to hear, um, you know, that you've come up with a few solutions yourself. And I'd be interested to know down the track how you're um, going with this, because it's the first cohort of learners that you've got going through. Um, but what I want to do is I just want to hand back to Mel now, who's going to go through the kind of Q&A section of the webinar. Thanks, Bridget. So yeah, I'd now like to open it up for questions. Uh, just a reminder, questions and comments can be submitted using the questions panel to the right of your screen if you'd like to submit any questions to us. And also, if we don't get to your questions um, this afternoon, we will be emailing you with responses to those after this webinar. I've had a couple of questions come through already. So Bridget, I'm going to throw back okay. to you for the first one. Um, did you consider interviewing the workers with the different levels of qualifications, as this may have provided quite a different perspective on the role, satisfaction, etc., than only talking to the employer? Uh, look, it would have, yeah, obviously, um, you know, made a different angle to the research. Um, but one thing is, it's actually very difficult to interview um, workers, especially um, to get in contact with them and have their employers agree. Um, you know, to give the time, but that is definitely something we could look, you know, look to in the future to kind of expand on the findings. Thank you. And um, also another question for you, Bridget. How do you intend to use the findings to get an outcome or influence policymakers? I think it's um, for us. It's more, um, you know, where our research goes. So just getting out there, talking about it. Um, you know, it does go directly to the government as well. So hopefully they look at it and we can maybe influence through that way. Um, Kane, I just wondered if you have any thoughts on what's been presented today, either by Michelle um, or Bridget. If there's anything else you'd like to add from your perspective with the quantitative research? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, I mean, one of the things that I'd like to say is that um, I think this has been a really um, good model for research. I think a lot of the times research is either quantitative or qualitative, um, but it's, I think what this project has shown is that the, both of them can be informed by each other. So the quantitative analysis obviously um, can benefit from, from qualitative and, and qualitative, I think, also can benefit from the quantitative. And, and I think that and I'm not sure, I mean, this is a question, I guess, for Bridget, which is, you know, to what extent um, the quantitative analysis was used um, to sort of prompt questions. But, um, but I think, you know, this is a, this, in an ideal world, you know, I think that there has been some, some quantitative questions, some questions that are currently quantitative analysis that can help inform um, the questionnaire. So I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a comment rather than a question. Um, but I think that, yeah, it's 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 a good model, so I'm so sort of happily happy to be part of it, and um, and uh, yeah, interested in hearing um, whether Bridget felt the same about the the interaction between the two. Yeah, I definitely felt that having that data analysis. So that was done. Um, that was the kind of the first stage that was done, and it helped to kind of you know provide direction for the. Um, interviews so it helped um, kind of identify um, you know sort of areas we could drill down into find those you know specific ASCO codes that would be suitable to um, for the interviews and yeah and then it's interesting um, you know when we 
look at it to see, okay, what they are saying, it does kind of match what was coming through the data as well. So it's you know, a good complement to each other. I do have a question and Kane, it might be um, a question for you, but if not, maybe Bridget. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody's asked, they understand the need to simplify the distinction between VET and higher ed crawls. So we did have that, that line of what we consider to be VET and higher ed. Um, I wonder what would happen in occupations where you find people with those AQF levels of eight or nine, so graduate certificates um, in a, a particular like services practice or building design. Has anyone mm. got anything on that? Do you want to go I mean, first, Kay? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the yeah, there's, I think the quantitative analysis also raises a lot of questions. Um, I mean, one of them, which I think is alluded to in that question, which is really about whether you see, because um, we know that, and I think this comes out in the qualitative analysis that people with their qualifications and higher education qualifications are doing different tasks in their jobs, but that might depend on the level of the qualification of that. So maybe some of the differences that we observe may not be so stark when you get to higher level um, of their qualifications. So at least for the quantitative analysis, pulling apart the analysis to see whether these differences in outcomes we observe depend on the on the level of their qualification is obviously an interesting question, but it's one that's sort of beyond the scope of, of, the, um, of the project and, and also <laughs> sort of pushing the data a little bit too hard. Um, so obviously we we have limited um, ability given the given the um, given the data to be able to sort of narrow in on those sort of fine finer questions. But I think certainly these um, these differences that we see they're going to vary. I think that's that's true to say, and they could well vary by qual. And I was going to say from the um, interview side of things, um, what I can um, what I kind of found when I was talking to employers is that yes, we made that distinction that um, you know VET was going to be diploma and lower and um, higher education was going to be you know higher than that. Um, but what I found is that that was kind of where you know the employers, what they were coming across was that they really were talking about like a, a, you know like a certificate three or four or a diploma um, is what is available to the people in their this particular occupation or it's a bachelor degree. So, um, those, um, you know, AQF level eight and nine um, level qualifications didn't really come up um, in those interviews at all. Sorry, Michelle, oh, I, were you I, wanting to say something? I was going to talk about required pri um, prior learning, you know, the whole RPL challenge that I think we have when we want to try and measure. I mean, I know in surveying, because there's no requirement to have a certificate or a diploma by law for any particular course that you're going to, you know, work that you're going to do, unless you want to work with transport, you know, people often will work for 20 years in a firm and then they might think that, yeah, sure, I'll get my qualification. And so trying to assess what level their knowledge and their skills and experience at is quite tricky. And in most cases, it's cheaper for them to go ahead and do the course. And then you're really teaching them how to suck eggs, you know, I mean, they know this stuff back to forwards, they could teach it, they do teach it to others, to new staff coming through. So I do think that there's kind of a gap here around if we actually want people in our workforce to be qualified, I think that we need to be not lax, I don't think we should drop our standards at all when it comes to education and recognition of education, but I think that we need to have a, a, a better way, a better process for recognising prior learning and experience and expertise because otherwise people won't go ahead and get their qualification which means they may not go on to do you know further study later in life. Just on that Michelle I've had um, a question you were suggesting a grading system in higher ed um, uh, sorry I think you're suggesting a grading system in the VET system and um, I've got a question here about can't there be another suggestion, can't a uh, higher ed just accept a competent outcome? Do you have any thoughts on that? I've been having that debate for quite some years, so if anybody's got a way to get that through, that'd be good. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I personally agree, like competent is competent, and I, I mean, you know, I don't know about 
you all, but you know, you did your degree, you've got your degree. Has anybody ever asked you what mark you got, whether you got a pass credit distinction or high distinction? I mean, unless you're gonna go on and do PhDs and further study and be a lecturer or something, does that really matter? And so is that a higher ed problem that they wanna keep their levels and their reputation and their income? I'm just, you know, maybe speaking out of turn there, sorry to all the higher ed people in the room. Um, no, I think that I think you're right, Michelle. And I think coming from a, um, a group a group of a university, there's no doubt that um, academic 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 standards is something that the universities prize really um, really highly and, and will protect. And I think there will always be um, a push to try and um, quantify the skills that people have before they come into the higher education system. I, I think that's that's part of the um, the transition is being able to prove. That you have the skills to be able to um, complete a degree. But I, but I also would argue that um, there are other reasons why you want to try and quantify skills, not just simply to make the transition easier from vet to higher education, but I think it's also it, it's it, it, it's a it's a um, it's a metric that you can potentially use to encourage quality training. And I think that personally speaking, um, the whole idea of competency it's it's just a it's a bit of a minimum it's, it's a bit of a minimum standard and it's really hard for employers to make informed choices about what skills people have if they're just competent um, mm -hmm. especially when you compete in a competitive labor market when you're trying to attract the best um, quality graduates and provide incentives for for train for for, um, for providers to build skills um, i think having a system where you can measure the skills that come out of um, of uh, vet provider courses is is providing the right incentives um, to 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 improve the quality of the training. I I do actually agree. I think we do need to have high standards, and we need to maintain those high standards. I think that this separation that we seem to have between vet and higher ed. You know, we need to bridge that gap. You know, I think that's treated like the poor cousin. Uh, and I, I think that we need to change that and we need to just accept that it's all education. Um, it's a little bit like continuing professional development. You know, do you need points or you don't need points? And therefore, if you need points, yours is more valuable. I don't think so. I think we need to just recognise that education is important throughout life and we need to somehow bridge that gap. Thank you. Um, I think given the time, we're going to wind up the questions here as um, we are running out of time. But as I said, we will respond to all outstanding questions via email. Um, I'd really like to thank Bridget, Kane and Michelle for joining us today and for their valuable insights. We will be sending out a short online evaluation survey via email and would appreciate it if you could take the time to please provide feedback as this does help us with future webinars. Thank you all for attending our webinar today. And please do stay connected with NCVR, either subscribe or follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you again. Goodbye.